Welcome to the City Life Family Podcast, a podcast for young and old. Our aim and vision here is to help equip you for the work of ministry and encourage you along the way. So my name's Chris, uh, lead pastor here at City Light Omaha, and uh, I'm with my good friend, Jared Cleaver, pastor at uh, Providence Church. And so uh, we get to be in the room together. Today, we're talking about the gathered church, That's okay? Right. And so uh, when the saints gather for worship, I want to ask you, Jared, um, how did you grow up viewing the gathered church? What was your experience? experience of it? Um, Did you anticipate going to church on Sunday? Uh, Was it something you had to do, you wanted to do? Uh, What was that like when you were a a boy growing up? Yeah, I didn't anticipate anything that happened in the morning. So let's (laughs) let's start there. Yes. Uh, I grew up in rural Nebraska and went to church 52 times a year on Sunday mornings. (laughs) And uh, I don't want to I mean, I'm going to blame my church growing up, yes. but I wasn't exactly like anticipating going. It was yes. like the thing that yes. you had to do. And yep. Sunday morning, like that was church. That was the church. It was the only thing, thing. Yeah. I right. knew. Um, and so I went there. There was no like kids programming during uh-huh. church. So I was sitting there and my mom had, you know, toys that she would hand me, <laughs> bags of snacks that yes. she would hand, to, you know, to keep me occupied. Sometimes I'm playing on the floor with Hot yes. Wheels, whatever. And so, uh, you know, I can't say that it was the highlight of my week. It mm-hmm. wasn't torture, but it was just what it was. It was what was, yeah. what was your experience? Yeah. So I grew up in a Catholic home. Uh, mom stayed, dad left, and mom was trying to figure out like, what do I do? do? Where yeah. do I take this? So she reverted back to what she knew, which was like, let's just take him to the Catholic church and they do something there. Uh, so it was the only time that I, rem- you know, and the good things was it, it did inst- kind of instill in me the fact that like God is real, yeah. right? Like uh, it, it answered the question of like, where did we come from? Um, and yet it didn't feel like a real spiritual family. We didn't have community outside of the church mm-hmm. on Sunday. Um, so going on Sunday felt like something we had to do to check a box, to please a God who was really distant. And it was also the only other time that like I saw grown people in robes. And uh, <laughs> so it was just a confusing time. I'm like, why are there people in robes? I don't understand what's happening here. So uh, it was not something that I said, you know what, this is really key to shaping and forming me. And part of that was I, I was attending a gathering uh, and not a Christian. So that was part of it. But, you know, at, at the City Light family, the reason we're asking that question is just, um, we do believe in the City Light family in, in the value of the gathered church. And, yeah, we all yeah. accentuate it. It's a big part of what we do. Yeah. And we would say, I believe you'd say, that comes from the Bible, right? Yeah, that, that's in the Bible. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of questions about the gathered church. I don't know if you yeah. realize this, but recently, like even digitally, what, yeah. what is that? Um, why should we value? I mean, we've been in this place as a culture discussing what is church and um, and how do we do it? And and I think some of the conversations that we kind of came into when we started planning churches is there was this whole movement of like, let's just get rid of the big gathering. Let's meet in bars. Let's just meet in homes. Let's kind of get rid of elder authority. And then this is just a person. And then we're just going to do life together and be a spiritual family. And it, that felt like a far swing. Yeah. But what they were really swinging away from was a gathered church that was consumeristic and they spent 90% of their budget and energy on just a one hour program to kind of entertain consumers. Mm-hmm. So there's this real swing, right? You've got mm-hmm. the big church with lots of programs and, and shiny things and kind of they're paying the paid professionals on Sunday. And that's the whole model is to get people in the room for that one hour. And then there's been this other movement of like, that doesn't work. That just creates big crowds and big budgets, but not disciples. And so let's just move the other way. Yeah. And kind of like get rid of that and we'll just kind of drink dark beer and discuss <laughs> reform, you know, theology in a bar or something, yeah. you know, like you, you know what, yeah, you've yeah, been yeah, a part yeah, of these yeah, conversations. Yeah, yeah. So, so where, where do you go? Like when you cast the vision for the gathered church sent, where yeah. do you go? Or like, yeah. where's your conviction line? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, so yeah, if you're listening, what we want to do right up front on this podcast is give you just a little theology on this. So one, I think Jesus gave us the aim, right, Jared? So for me personally, like Jesus gave me the aim and the mission is to make disciples of Jesus, Matthew 28, right? So go and make disciples of all nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So there's this teaching component after we mm-hmm. baptize people, that's really big. And yeah. there's this ongoing shaping and forming. Well. Then you get into the Acts. How did the New Testament church, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit drops, uh, Peter preaches the gospel, 3,000 people come to faith in Jerusalem. Well, what are their typical gatherings? Well, they go to the temple 
for the teaching and they, they break bread in each other's homes. So there's this, they're in homes, they are in each other's lives, they're sharing meals together, but there's also this teaching component. And then, then you go into Hebrews, I love Hebrews. It says this, uh, you know, chapter 10, verse 25, do not, uh, do not, uh, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more. And so there's this, hey, there's this encouragement in scripture to not stop gathering as God's people. And we just feel like it's important um, to gather regularly on a Sunday morning with the multi-generation family of God. Uh, this is your spiritual family, old and young, coming underneath the authority of God's word. And... Um, and participating uh, in this gathering. We, and I think about Paul, you know, Paul was a great pastor. So one of the, the challenges I, I have is like, what is our burden for the church? Is it just bigger crowds? Is that the, is that what we are, God would do, if we, God answered all of our prayers, would there just be more people in services? No, like it's exactly what you've talked about in the past. We want people to be shaped and formed in the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. They'd be transformed from one degree of glory to another as yep. they behold Christ Jesus. Well, how, how do they get shaped and formed? I think there's something about gathering with the family of God, coming underneath the authority of God's word, responding in worship to Jesus, participating in, in communion and breaking bread, that that actually shapes and forms us and reminds us of who we are, stirs our affections from the Lord and almost like a fresh grace, fresh meal yeah. to help sustain us for another week. So, so that is the gathered church. We love it. We think it's an essential value and rhythm because uh, historically as the church, we've gathered for thousands of years. We need to keep gathering, keep worshiping, uh, keep fellowshipping. So uh, it, it's a value. So Jared, uh, how does that land on you? Are you, a, are you a shareholder on that value or where do you land on that? Yeah, man. I, so I, you know, I've had to think about this because when you have this, this history of yes. like, oh, I kind of went to church because I had to, you're like, yeah. you know, the natural heart or the natural thing is like swing the other direction and yeah. do the other thing. But you realize the power that comes, the formation that comes, yeah. the relationships that develop, yeah. the, the unity of like, if you just pause in a church gathering, you know, when you're meeting together as yeah. Hebrews 10 is telling us to do, and you listen to these voices and you're like, man, you know, everyone in the room is struggling, but they're still singing this or clinging on, on to Come Jesus. On. Yes. And you're like, there's something unique and powerful that's uniting us, especially when you think about how different the people are in the room yeah. and you look on the outside, it's like every, every impulse is to say, mm. you know, divide, like let's have distinctions, but yet there's all these like different unique people that are in the room and we're displaying something yeah. unifying under the gospel. Like if you let your, if I let myself stop and think about that, whether I'm on stage or whether I'm, you know, in the front row, listening to the people behind me, there's something powerful to that. And so I love, I mean, I think it's laid out, like you said, it's mm -hmm. laid out in the new Testament. And I'm like, we get like, uh, I think, I think there's power in yep. formational yep. power in yes. doing that. Yeah. Yes. Breach. So how do we judge success? So there's some, you know, ministry workers, first of all, if you spend time alone in prayer, for the gathered church, asking the spirit of God to move, that's not wasted time. Yeah. If you spend time preparing worship sets, thinking how are people gonna sing through the gospel, um, sing through confession, sing through adoration and praise, sing through songs that help us remember our dependence on God, that is not a waste of energy. If you are a leader and you're thinking, how do I actually just keep this whole thing going. I've got to actually, I've got to commission God's people to use their gifts and kids ministry and hospitality and security. That's not a waste of energy and time. That is loving servant leadership, uh, using your ministry gifts to bless God's people as they gather together. I just want to say thank you. And then, you know, as you think about uh, Jared, what are the essentials on the gathered church? Like, you know, there's a lot of things we could do in our time together. So what are the things that, that biblically should happen um, as we gather God's people? Yeah. So, you know, in our churches, we try to center everything around the gospel. Right. Yep, yep. And so like, okay, how do we, how do we do this gospel thing? Well, this good news, how do yep. we, how do we do this for the people? And so one of the things that we love is to declare the gospel through preaching, right? Yeah. There's somebody that gets up there, we read the scripture and then somebody gets up there and declares the gospel, declares the good news mm. through the word of God. Mm. And so somebody's up there 
heralding that thing and people are listening, ready to soak it in, yes. you know, just the, just that life giving thing of yep. declaring the gospel. Um, we also think of responding to the gospel in yes. worship, right? We clear time in our gatherings to, yes. to sing, to sing these yes. gospel rich words that are our opportunity in the midst of everything that's happened during the week to come in and say, Hey God, you are still the same. You're still the rock. You're still the thing that we cling to. We're still going to celebrate you. We're yes. still like, and, and it's this beautiful thing of joining our, mm. our voices together to respond to what God has been doing to his faithfulness to us, no matter what, how faithful or unfaithful mm. we've been during the previous week. And then, um, you know, we believe that in scripture, Jesus, there's, there's two sacraments or ordinances that, that he has commanded us to do communion and baptism. And so we display, we have an opportunity to display the gospel uh -oh. through those specific things. And Come so on. it's like, we're, we're using our bodies. We're getting up, we're coming yeah. forward, empty handed. Mm. We've got nothing. We're bringing nothing to the table. Come on. We come, you know, to the front or we come wherever, however your church does it. And, and by the end of it, you've got something in your hands, yeah. not because of what you've done, but because mm. Jesus hands us something. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just a beautiful thing. And so we're, we're declaring the gospel. We're responding to the gospel. We're displaying the gospel. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. And I think um, measuring, quote, success or centering our gatherings around that is just a, a lot healthier way than to be obsessed about the, you know, the counter of the number. Like, hey, yes. it, what, did we do the right thing today? Hey, let's look at how many people came. Well, oh, yeah. wait, what's that tell us? Oh, you know, yeah. that feeds our, feeds our egos maybe, yes. but that's not, I don't think that's what Jesus is calling us to do when he calls us to, to faithfully gather together. Come on. Exactly. No, I'm with you on that, all that. And by the way, that was, that was fire. And, uh, I want to confess to you, Jared, one temptation though. I remember Twitter was really big for a season and people were coming to church looking for like tweets from their pastor. And there was a time where I measured success as a young pastor. I'd get in my car and I'd check my phone and like, Ooh, did I get a, did I get a tweet? Did somebody tweet something yeah. I said? Oh, did yeah. I say something profound? Yeah. And it was messing with my heart. Cause you're like, is this how I'm going to start to measure it? And like, I think pastors are still going to be tempted to get on, you know, whatever, Facebook, Instagram, whatever streaming device. How many, how many streams did we, how many, yeah. how many people yeah. shared what we did? And, and it's like, no, you're not just producing content that's shareable, mm -hmm. right? You're gathering God's people for his glory and for their good. And so we just have to remember kind of what we're aiming at because those other things will pull at you. Oh yeah. yeah. I, yeah. You, you see somebody post a picture of you up front mm -hmm. there and preaching, you get a little fire emoji, oh. but this sermon, what? And then we get two fire oh, emojis uh -oh. a three a and you're fire. like, oh. I don't even need to read my Bible this week. I'm Ooh, filled up on come that. Come on now. Come not, on. Not healthy. No, no. no probably it, not the thing we're aiming for. It, it, it feels it, good in the moment. And there's this weird pastor culture <laughs> where I see pastors doing this. Like somebody will, will, will post something on social media. Like, oh, my pastor's preaching or whatever. I'm at home watching from home. And then, and then the pastor will retweet what, or reshare <laughs> what they shared. And I'm like, I don't get this. Like what's happening? Is this a culture? Like we're measuring success based on somebody took my photo, posted it and I reshared it. I don't know what's happening. I just, Hey, just pay attention. Is the gospel being shared, responded to and, and displayed? I totally. like that. That's yeah. probably a better, better essential. Hey, <laughs> what else should we be paying attention to Jared? As we think about coming on a Sunday morning, gathering as a Sunday morning, obviously the word worship, um, the sacraments, those are essentials, but is there other stuff we should pay attention to, uh, as pastors, leaders, uh, even members that are walking in, uh, what should, what questions should we be asking and what should we be paying attention to at a church yeah. gathering? Well, yeah. I, I do think, uh, there's just ways that you can see the gospel taking root just by the culture that's happening. Yeah. And yeah. so one of the things that, that I love because we consider the church a family, you look on, you know, Sunday mornings and I love it when, when you kind of, after a long, long time, you have to kick people out because people yes. are just lingering around. Yes. People want to not just greet each other, yes. but like being, being in each other's lives, talking to each other. There's this sense in which there's real relationships and people are processing life. They're getting yep. to know each other. They're welcoming. Like there's something beautiful about yes. that. There's, yeah, there's lots of things like that as well. Like when you see, um, when people are just praying, like yep. people are, praying for each other. They're praying yes. in, in our, like whatever, like there's a sense of like real, like communion with God. I mean, I don't know what, yeah. what else are you? Oh yeah. No, there's of? so many of those things, but I think I mean, even as uh, a pastor, you rejoice when you see those Yeah, because you're like, 
hey, this this is not just everybody coming to hear a word from a celebrity preacher up front. This is a family gathering, and there's there's relationships that are outside of me, a web of relationships. Um, but I'm looking for a couple things. I, I think it's really important uh, what we're calling people to. So um, are, are people serving or are they just sitting around being served? Um, I, I think that's just the gospel frees us from just showing up, consuming, come serve me, come teach me, come lead me, um, to is there some level of, of measure of maturity where God's people are showing up to the gathering saying, how can I give? Who can I encourage? Mm-hmm. How can I serve? How can I put um, on display my ministry gift and exercise that um, for the good of my brothers and sisters? So everything from greeters to hospitality, to security, yeah. to kids, like there's a ton of people doing uh, all kinds of sound work and lighting, and they're just giving their time and talent oh, yeah. away to bless God's people. So I, I look for that. Like, is that happening? Uh, and then the last thing is like, are, are we actually um, calling people to go? Is the invitation just come back next Sunday, we'll mm-hmm. see you, or is it, hey, go now yeah. and show and tell the world about this this Jesus who's done a great work for them. So are we calling people and commissioning them out uh, for mission, not just saying, hey, come back, come back, come back. Yeah. So I'm looking for gospel stuff like that. And then mm-hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of things, but just little things like greeters and uh, celebration. I will say this, do not in the church gathering, I think that we can overlook the importance of very small things like a call to worship mm-hmm. that can set the tone so early. I'm, I'm looking also for announcements. I know that sounds like, oh, is this just business stuff? But man, what you celebrate as a church, uh, it, it communicates what you value as a church. What you're calling people into communicates your kingdom heart. And so don't overlook those small little areas of the gathering. Those are not just tack-ons, throwaways. Those are really, really significant mm. moments mm. that are displaying gospel culture mm-hmm. and really your heart. So um, that's all stuff to be paying attention to. So if you're listening and you might be a staff member, okay, so Jared, we've seen this. What are some of your, what's your heart when a pastor walks into the room for the gathering, an elder, one of your staff, what are your hopes for their posture that morning? What are you hoping that would, would mark their activity? What's marking their heart? What's marking their hands? What's marking their mind? What's marking their eyes? What do you want that ministry leader to be thinking about as they pull into the parking lot on a Sunday morning, getting ready to, to gather with God's people? Mm. Yeah. Any expectations you have or hopes well, you have? Yeah. You know, so I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you have this as well, where you like expect people to show up at a certain time. Yeah. Right. And I get that. Like if I'm preaching a sermon, I've probably spent a little bit more time in prayer for that yeah. morning that somebody else or than somebody else who's coming, who doesn't yes. have a volunteer role, but they're yes. a staff person there, but they're called to be on. And I think with that, um, there's just a sense in which like, this is a, this is an important, like spiritual thing. It's an important relational thing. And so like your heart should be ready to like minister, but because you don't have a role, you've got to be ready when you come in to like have eyes to see people, to, to like be looking around for opportunities. Um, not even just relationally, but you know, there's fires to put out on, on Sunday Mm. morning. So just having that, a humble posture of like, okay, I'm going to this gathering. God has called me to do this. I'm a leader. And so I need to lead the way by serving, by relationally engaging. Uh, and, and I would hope staff people, you know, they're getting their hearts ready at the very least you're driving in. It's like, even if you're late, you're like, Hey, maybe spend some time with Jesus on that car ride in and like pray about that. So you're ready to come. And then, you know, just, I kind of started talking about this, but relationally there's opportunities all over the place to move toward people. I think we talked about this, you know, a a few times ago, but like if there's somebody standing by themselves, that's like a, that's an emergency, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, somebody you ask someone like, how are you doing? And they say, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Like our, our MO in, in America is to say, yeah, Oh, I'm doing good. So if somebody hesitates a little bit, like that's an open door to be able to, to lean in, uh, ask them how they're doing, take every single opportunity to like pray for people. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what do you think? Cause you think yeah, no, through that, your staff that's, team. That's it. I, I always have a couple, you cannot take people where you haven't been. So that morning it is a spiritual battle. You're usually tired. You're the first one up right now in the middle of winter. It's cold. It's dark. Your flesh wants to remain in bed. 
But the reality is, is there is a spiritual battle going on for the lives of those people. And so just begging God, even if you, you know, you're, like you said, begging God, God, would you move in me? God, I'm dependent on you. God, help me to show and share the love of Jesus today. Help me um, to use my lips to encourage. Whatever that is, making yourself available. Spirit of God, work in me to work through me today. Um, so don't skip just that time of prayer. Make that a priority. I always ask God, God, give me eyes to see people through your eyes, the mm. eyes of Jesus. Mm. And I think you'll see different kinds of people then. Um, then finally, like give me an opportunity to show and share your love today. So, and then I would just encourage our staff and our leaders to be really bold with inviting people to pray. Mm. You know, it, it's amazing how many people just haven't been prayed for by a pastor, by a friend, mm -hmm. by a ministry leader. They don't have anybody else in their life oftentimes that will grab them. They might say, I will pray for you this week, but pray right there with people. That totally. is such a huge totally. moment for people. And then when I come in, one of my pet peeves, I'll just say this, my pet peeves are a couple things. My pet peeves are one, moody ministry workers that walk in and you bring all of your junk to Sunday morning. And uh, that's okay to be weak, to be messy, to invite somebody to pray with you because you're coming in in that place. But you just have to understand like, the significance when you've got the microphone on stage and just because you're moody, that's not everybody else's mood. Don't mm -hmm. project that on everyone mm -hmm. else. And then number two, like if we're just huddled as shepherds in the back and we're all hanging out, talking about our weekend and, and enjoying each other. Meanwhile, the entire flock has no, sh no shepherds around it. That kind of bothers me. I'm yeah. like, guys, the sheep are here. Like we have all week, we can talk through ministry philosophy, catch up as friends, but like this moment is a holy moment. Like we've got to run at God's people right now. And by the way, I have to confess the temptation. I want to stop by the sound booth and mess around and yeah. laugh. And I want, oh, I want to go back and, and find a yeah. place where I can pull away for a few minutes. But, but just understanding I've got to discipline my body for this couple hours to really engage with God's people mm. uh, is significant. So, okay, Jared, we're going to do one last question. We're going to make you touch this fire. And the fire is, what about digital or online gathering? So <laughs> well, you guys know COVID changed the whole game. There's already been this massive shift in our culture of everything going digital, right? You no longer go and look at a house in person. You go online, you look at it on Zillow or some website, then you decide to go. And we've seen this happen in the church. People are visiting church websites, social media, before they're ever walking in the building. But now with COVID, every church went online because they had to. And now the, the church is trying to figure out, are we a digital church with physical locations in supplemental form? Or are we a, we a church family that gathers physically and we supplement with digital? Hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. So you kind of make that decision. What's the primary audience? What's gonna get our attention? And pastors are making this decision. Ministry leaders are making this decision because they're either looking into the camera because that's the primary audience or they're looking around the room, engaging the people in the room and then letting people kind of look in. So how, how would you encourage us to be thinking through this issue? Well, first of all, we solved our problem two years ago by not having enough volunteers to do online yes. gatherings. Yes. And so we're, we're out of the game already. <laughs> yes. So I don't have to think about this yes. issue. Yes. Um, but I think, uh, I wanna hear your thoughts too. Yep. But I think just real quick, right off, like there is, uh, regardless of technology, yeah. there is a relational component yep. to the church and to the gathering, uh, our, and to the gathering of the people. And there is something unique. We know this inherently. Yeah. There's something unique about being face to face in a room with people or right next to people mm. um, that's different that you just can't do on a screen. Like, you don't have. Like you want to take your, your marriage online. Yeah. No, that doesn't even make any sense no. to you. Yeah. Right. Because you know, there's something unique about our bodies being in the same yep. room together. Yep. Um, that I think, uh, is like, it, it's something that can't be replaced no. online. And I think, I mean, there's all sorts of thoughts, but I think that's just the first yeah. thought of like, there's things that you just can't accomplish, but I, I'm curious to hear. Your yeah. Thoughts. I mean, the, the basic one is the incarnation. Yeah. Jesus stepped into a real time and space, had a real body. He still does. Yeah. You know, when you see him, he'll still have a fleshly human body. So, so when you, when, when we think about church, we're like, well, listen, I think we are incarnational beings with real bodies that are really shaped by the environments yeah. we go to. And so, um, and then I also think it's just about the biblical mandates pray for one another, encourage one another, um, greet each other with psalms and spiritual songs. Like, how do you, how do you live this out? Um, how do you serve one another if, if you're just digitally isolated? 
it's one thing to watch a sermon online with your phone. It's a whole nother thing to step into gathering and realize this is a grace. I am not alone on this side of eternity. Mm. God has surrounded me with a multi-ethnic, multi-generational spiritual family. Mm -hmm. He's covered me, he surrounded me. God has given me a place to belong. Um, when you're singing and you're hearing not just your voice, but you're hearing the voice of the saints, it reminds you of heaven. Where are we going? We will be worshiping at the throne someday. Um, when you're there in that room and you're serving and being served, it reminds you you're a part of a body and you might be the hand and somebody else is the foot, but there's people with different spiritual gifts and we're all doing this thing to represent King Jesus together. And so I, I would just say there's so many things that cannot happen digitally. Now, we wanna have no condemnation. You're sick. Uh, you've got some limitations physically. Uh, you're isolated. Maybe you're at a distance. You, you, you physically can't drive to the building because you're on vacation or traveling for work. Please, please, please. We're not saying this is a, a hard and fast rule, but uh, I think our conviction is God's people have to, they should be gathering physically yeah. um, under local elders, committing to a spiritual family. And and we believe that's probably the healthiest way for you to be growing. So anyways, that little encouragement there. So uh, pastors continue to labor hard, elders, leaders. Uh, we want to encourage you guys. We know it takes a lot of work, a lot of planning. I don't think it's wasted energy. So mm. thank you guys for dialing in as me and Jared talk about the gathered church today.